Welcome to the unit on Early Modern History. This unit aims to provide you with an overview of this period. This unit comprises of four modules. Each module has a final review section that invites you to reflect on what you have learnt. By the end of this unit, students will be able to examine the range and diversity of costumes, coiffer, and ornaments during the Renaissance, 17th century Baroque, 18th century Rococo and 19th century Victorian periods. The first module focuses on the Renaissance between the 15th and 16th century. This timeline gives a glimpse of the events during this period. Renewed interest in the writings of the classical period came from the work of lawyers and notaries in the Italian city-states who looked to Roman law for justification of the independence of these territories. Petrarch, an Italian writer also trained in law, contrasted the humanistic approach of the classics with what he saw as a narrow academic philosophy in the medieval universities. Italy referred to a geographic area made up of a number of small city-states. A powerful prince ruled each city-state. Often these princes engaged in warfare with each other. And it was this failure to unify under a single leader that resulted in the loss of large parts of Italy to other nations. In Renaissance Italy, the population was divided between aristocracy, the merchant class, artisans and artists, the town labourers and the peasants of the countryside. Successful merchants sought to become more respectful by marrying into aristocratic family. Sons inherited family wealth. Girls could take only a small portion even if they didn't have any brothers. Most of the family wealth went towards the dowry for the daughter. If a family had many daughters, some would be sent to convents. The sons of merchants were educated to succeed their fathers in running the family business. Skilled artisans could do well. Unskilled labourers had a harder life, managing ends from day to day. Peasants were at the bottom of the pyramid, who farmed land owned by a landowner and suffered heavy losses with vagaries of the weather and armies that constantly ravaged the countryside, fighting for one city or the other. Wool and silk were primarily loomed in Italy. Fibers were imported from all over Europe. Silk was cultivated locally. Improvements in silk weaving looms were made at about this time, which resulted in the increase in complexity of decoration of Italian silk fabrics, which are evidenced in Renaissance paintings. Many of these fabrics utilized patterns and decorative motifs that were Chinese, Indian or Persian in origin. A, re a reflection of the close trading contacts. Some Renaissance painters also designed patterns for textiles. Wealthy people ordered their clothing from tailors who made clothing for both men and women. Tailoring skills were refined during the 14th century once the tailors had mastered the making of buttoned closures. The less affluent might make their own clothing or could purchase second-hand or used clothing from specialized tradesmen. Some evidence of ready-made clothing being available also exists. Cross-cultural influences from the Middle East also had a profound impact on this period. Once the Ottoman Turks conquered Byzantine Empire, they remained a constant threat to Eastern Europe. At the same time, Turks controlled the trade routes to Asia or the Orient. Treaties were made to permit safe passage of trading caravans through Turkish controlled lands. As a result of this, many influences were noted in fashion from the Middle East and Far East. Textile patterns, turban-like hat styles, etc., to name a few. The main sources of evidence on this period are the Renaissance paintings because of its realistic treatment of fabric and costume details. 
However, some paintings of religious or mythological nature tend to show imaginary costumes and should be considered with caution. The main costumes for men in the 15th century were Kamicha, worn as an undergarment, was a shirt visible at the edges or openings of the outermost garments. Laborers wore the shirt with underpants for manual work. Sleeves and body were cut in one piece with gussets inset under the sleeve to permit ease of movement. Lengths vary between waist to hip above the knees. Hose was worn with all garments and tied with lacings to the doublet. Doublets ended anywhere from waist to below the hips. In longer lengths, doublets were cut with a small skirt. They had a close fit with multiple seams. Doublets and jackets had a distinctive neckline finish at the back. A deep U-shape cutout was inserted with a curved U-shape with a straight top edge. This gave a dartless, smooth finish to the back. Mid-century jackets fit smoothly through the torso and had a flared skirt attached that ended below the hips. Late-century jackets were fitted over the shoulders and upper chest and then fell in full pleat from a yoke. This fullness was belted in at the waist. At the end of the century, sleeveless jackets that looked like hukes were seamed at the shoulder and opened under the arms, were full and pleated and worn belted or beltless. Sleeve styles were distinctive styles in Italian dress. Early in the century, sleeves were cut in two sections, one full and somewhat puffed from shoulder to elbow and the other section fitted to the wrist. Mid-century, one-piece sleeves were cut full at the shoulder and tapered gradually to the wrist. In the second half of the century, sleeves tended to be fitted. If sleeves were too tight to allow easy movement, one or more openings were left through, which the long sh through which uh, a white long shirt sleeve could be seen. Seams were left open at various places and closing them with laces or making a horizontal seam at the elbow and leaving it open at the back where the elbow bends. The fabric of the kamicha was then pulled through the openings between the laces to form decorative puffs. If laced sleeves were interchangeable, uh, from one garment to another. Hanging sleeves were generally non-functional, purely decorative and attached to the jackets. Seen during ceremonial occasions and worn over a doublet so that the doublet sleeve can be seen through. For outdoors and for warmth, men wore open and closed capes. They covered the jacket completely, varying in length according to the jacket length, often trimmed with fur or lined in contrasting colors hair and headdress. Younger men cut their hair in medium to long length that tapered gradually from below the ears in front to about the shoulders in the back. Hair might be straight or curly. Older men cut their hair shorter. Men were generally clean shaven. A variety of hat styles are seen in the paintings including turban-like styles, brimless pillbox style, either soft or rigid high tocks and hats with soft crowns and upturned brims or round crowns and narrow brims. For footwear, pointed shoes were worn. These began to round off at the front. Leather-soled footed hose were most popular. When worn, shoes fitted closely and were high across the instep and below the ankle bone. Boots were generally worn for indoors. For women, the most common combination of dress during the Italian Renaissance was a chemise called camicia worn as an undergarment beneath a dress and a second overdress on top. The kamicha was full length, sleeves, uh, sleeves are generally long and often cut in raglan styles. Large sections of the kamicha were displayed at the neckline of gowns and fine embroidery, bindings, smocking or edgings were added. Overdresses were relatively straight cut and made of opulent fabrics. Some dresses were cut straight from shoulder to hem with a smooth-fitting, yoke-like construction over the shoulders, which opened into full pleats or gathers over the bust line. These dresses were belted. Another dress style was made of a bodice joined to a full pleated or gathered skirt. These were closed by lacing up the front or at the sides. Necklines were usually rounded but cut high. Later they became lower. 
some more square or with deep V's held together by lacing that showed the upper part of the kameecha. Outer dresses were cut like a man's huke, that is, sleeveless, seamed at the shoulders and open under the arms to display the underdress. Sleeves were wider above the elbow and fitted below, or close-fitting sleeves with opening to display the sleeves of the kameecha or hanging sleeves. Mantles or capes were worn outdoors, were both open and closed, often lined with contrasting lining and sometimes matched the dresses. Italian women arranged their hair elaborately, wearing a token head cover in the form of a small jewelled net set at the back of the head or a sheer small veil. Young girls dressed their hair simply, curled into long tresses. Women placed a loose curling tress on either side of the face and pulled the rest into a bun or a long braid or made more elaborate arrangements that combined braids, loops of hair and curls. For footwear, women's shoes seemed to be cut along the same lines as those of men. Jewelry consisted of a chain or a band of metal or pearls that were worn across the forehead with a bejeweled decoration located over the center of the forehead. The chain was called a fer ferronier. The main costumes for men in the 16th century were Black work, a black on white Spanish embroidery was especially popular. A close fitting doublet was worn over the camicha without a jacket to create an extremely narrow silhouette. Later styles became fuller. Some had deep necklines to show off embroidered camiche. Decorative slashings, sometimes with puffs of contrasting fabric, pulled through the slits. Some jackets had short sleeves ending just below the shoulder line, which allowed a contrast between the jacket and the sleeve of the doublet. Hose, which was attached to the doublets, had a distinct padded codpiece. Women wore the kamicha. This was cut high to show above the neckline of the gown to form a small border. It was often embroidered and finished with a small neckline ruffle. Dress silhouettes grew wider and fuller. Bodices became more rigid, a reflection of the increasing Spanish influence. Square, wide and low necklines predominated. Sleeves widened, they had a full wide puff at the top and were more closely fitted from above the elbow to the wrist. Many were decorated with puffs and slashes. Waistlines were straight in the early part of the century. Spanish influence V-shaped in V-shapes in the front gradually began to appear. Turbans became quite fashionable. They were derived from Turkish headdress and reflected Italian trading contacts with the Turks of the Ottoman Empire. Costumes varied according to different regions. Venetian women of the 15th century wore gowns with the waistline located just below the bosom. Venetian gowns had normal waistlines in the back and a deep U-shape in the front. Chopines were high platform soled shoes were worn throughout Italy and in Northern Europe. Women bleached their hair to light blonde shades. They arranged their hair at the front uh, above the forehead in little twin horns. Men's costume waistlines were at the anatomical waistline at the back and dipped to a V at the front. Long outer tunics were preferred to jackets. High officials in Venice wore long establishing traditional robes with wide sleeves. During the Northern Renaissance, there was an interest in science, philosophy and morality. The printing press helped in the dissemination and publishing of the arguments of the reformers, thus leading to a revolution against the Roman Catholic Church. Reformation of the Protestants led to the split of Europe into two hostile religious camps. On to the Spanish Golden Age. During this age, Spain became very wealthy from the influx of gold, silver from Mexico and Peru and remained a stoutly orthodox religious nation. During the reign of Queen Elizabeth in England, the Renaissance movement enjoyed developments in literary works, music, art, etc. French courts were influenced by Italian dressmakers, cooks, craftsmen, perfumers, lace makers, etc. Through political marriage also, starting new industries, industries of silk, weaving, lace making and perfumeries, etc. 
The main factors in the dissemination of fashion information was the intermarriage of the royal families from different countries. The brides were equipped with not just a substantial dowry, but also a trousseau of the latest fashions and accompanied by a group of fashionably, gown, fashionably gowned ladies in waiting. Other sources of fashion information included imported garments and fabrics, books dealing with costume, and travelers who brought back information about the examples of foreign styles. Cross-cultural influences from the Middle East also had an effect on this period. Trade alliances were made between the French King Francis I and the Sultan Suleiman, leader of the Ottoman Turks. Style ideas brought back by diplomats, merchants, and travelers from the Middle East entered European courts. The Turks were viewed as fierce and exotic. Ballets, masks, and dramas features Turkish characters, but often portrayed in a derogatory manner. Their costume, however, fascinated many, and the ropa, a loosely fitted overdress, seems to be derived from the Turkish robes. During this period, a treadle power spinning wheel com combination with a device called bobbin and flyer mechanism made spinning easier. Hand knitting seems to have begun in the 16th century and was used to make stockings. When William Lee sought a pattern for a knitting machine for stockings in 1589, Queen Elizabeth refused, fearing that it would put the hand knitters out of business, so Lee took his invention to France. New techniques of decorating fabrics into style were created. Spanish embroideries consisted of delicate black silk figures wore, worked on fine white linen, often being applied to the neckband and wrists of men's shirt and women's chemises. Italian drawn and cutwork techniques were also used. Threads were removed from the fabric and embroidery applied to the now open areas. Cutwork was created by embroidery designs on solid cloth, then cutting away sections of the cloth between the decorations. Fillet or laces. Embroidery is done on a net background. Both cutwork and laces are considered forerunners of lace. Lace differs from either cutwork or fillet in that it is constructed entirely from threads, dispensing with any backing fabric. Two types of lace were made, needlepoint lace, which started in Italy, and bobbin lace, which may have started in the Low Countries. Art is the primary source of information about what people wore. Portraits, drawings and tapestries abound among the possessions of wealthy merchants and upper-class citizens. Other sources of information include a number of books about costumes were published, documentary sources from royal household inventories and actual garments that have survived from the 16th century. The main costumes for men during the 16th century were shirts. These were made of white linen and were cut full and gathered into round or square neckline and raglan sleeves. The necklines were often decorated with embroidery or cutwork. During the later half of the century, the shirt collar became a kind of ruffle and eventually the ruff, which was an individual piece of clothing made very wide, often of lace and stiffly starched. It became a characteristic feature of the 16th and 17th century costume. Doublets and hose were laced together. The doublet was only waist length. Hose had an attached codpiece. One version of the doublet called the padlock was cut with a deep V at the front which sometimes had a filler or a stomacher of contrasting color inserted. Towards the mid-century, the doublet had a row of small square flaps called picadils placed just below the waist. Sleeves, though padded, followed the shape of the arm and narrowed as the century progressed. Waistlines were natural at the back and dipped to a point at the front, where padding emphasized the shape. The effect became very pronounced and was called peace cord belly. Laces were used as closures as well as to hold the sleeve in place. Jacket or jerkin was worn over the doublet and cut the same length and shaping as the doublet. It was with or without sleeves. Bases were separate short skirts worn with a jacket or doublet for civil dress or over armor for military dress. Gowns or robes were long, 
full garments with long funnel shaped or large hanging sleeves that opened down the front. The front facings were made of contrasting fabric or fur and turned back to form wide decorative rubbers. Younger, more fashionable men wore shorter gowns ending below the hips. Circular cloaks open at the front with a slit up the back to facilitate horseback riding were worn for outdoors. Later, capes replaced the gowns. Short capes were cut very full, flaring out sharply from the shoulder. The second phase from 1515 to 1530 of men's costume emphasized fullness in the construction of the costume with large, bulky, puffed areas, decorative slashings or panes with contrasting linings. Sleeves were cut very full with a puff from the armhole to elbow, ending with a close fit at the wrist. Hose was divided into two sections, upper stocks or breeches and nether stocks. Style variations included skin-tight skin -tight version, wide at the top and tapering to the knee called Venetians, wide and full throughout called open breeches, melon-shaped trunk hose were usually painted heavily padded and ended at the hip and looked like the shape of a pumpkin. Galley gaskins or slops sloped gradually from a narrow waist to fullness concentrated about mid-thigh where they ended. Culottes were a short section with just a pad around the hips with very tight fitting hose. Trunk hose and to a lesser extent doublets were heavily padded with bombast, a stuffing made of wool, horsehair, short linen fibers called toe or bran. Towards mid-century, there is a gradual decrease in the width of the shoulders and a gradual increase in the width of the hip area. Canyons were extensions from the end of the trunk hose to the knees or slightly below that. Stockings more, were more often used with trunk hose and canyons than the long joint hose. Stockings and hose were either cut and sewn or knitted. At the beginning of the century, men kept their hair ear to shoulder length with a fringe of bang across the forehead. By 1530, beards became fashionable and hair was cut short. After the mid-century, men grew their hair longer and beards and moustaches remained popular. Pillbox-like shaped hat with a turned-up brim was worn. This was also called a French bonnet. Skull caps were also worn over the which basin-shaped hats with a wide brim. Feathers and plumes, braids and jewels were used for decoration. For women, chemise were the, was the undermost garment. Gowns were worn over the chemise and were fairly plain and sober colors. Bodices were fitted, skirts were long and full, flaring gently from the waistline to the floor in the front and trailing into long trains at the back. Women wore either a single dress or two layers consisting of outer and underdress. In the case of the latter, outer skirt might be looped up in front to display the contrasting skirt of the underdress. Trains on outer gowns had decorative underlinings. The train was buttoned or pinned to the waist at the back in order to show the lining fabric. Necklines were square with the edge of the chemise visible. V-shaped openings at the front and back neck that were held in place by lacings. Sleeve styles were smooth fitting narrow sleeves with decorative cuffs, wide funnel shaped with contrasting lining and hanging sleeves. When two gowns were worn, the undergown had closely fitted sleeves and the outer gown had large full funnel shaped sleeves or hanging sleeves. Women wore long full cloaks for outdoors. In Germany, 1530 to 1575, Skirts were gathered softly and joined to closely fitted bodices that had low square or rounded necklines. The neckline was usually filled in, most often by the chemise. Bodices were elaborately decorated or embroidered across the bosom. Sleeves were close fitting with tight horizontal bands alternating with somewhat enlarged buffed areas. The cuff extended to a point over the wrist. Hair was often held in a net over which a wide-brimmed hat with plumes was placed. Gold chains frequently worn along with white jeweled dog collar were important status symbols. In Northern Europe countries, 1530 to 1575, 
the petticoat replaced the inner gown. The overall silhouette was rather like an hourglass. Bodices narrowed to a small waistline, skirts gradually expanded to an inverted cone, cone shape with an inverted V opening at the front. The bodice narrowed and flattened, becoming quite rigid and the waist dipped to an elongated V at the front. A rich bejeweled belt outlined the waistline and from the dip in front its long end fell down the center front of the gown, almost to the floor. At first, most necklines were square. Later, closer styles were preferred, like the standing, wing collars or necklines filled by the chemise, which closed up to the throat and ended in a small ruffle. Ruffs of moderate size were worn with high fitted collars. Many sleeves were narrow at the shoulder and expanded to a huge white cuff at, that turned back on it. The cuff was often made of fur or of heavy brocade that matched the petticoat. A detachable false sleeve decorated with panes and slashes through which linen of the chemise was visible might be sewn to the underside of the cuff or if the chemise was richly decorated, the sleeve of the chemise might be seen below the cuff. Another style had a puff at the shoulder and a close-fitting long extension to the sleeve to the wrist. Sleeve decorations included cutting, painting with decorative fabrics and fastenings with panes with augulets, small jeweled metal points. Padded rolls of fabric were sometimes located at the joining of bodice and sleeve to hide lace fastenings. Skirts became more rigid. Many dresses were untrained and floor length. The flare cone-shaped skirt required support to achieve the desired rigidity of line. A Spanish device called verdugal or Spanish farthingale provided that support. It was a construction of whalebone, cane or steel hoops graduated in size from the waist to the floor and sewn into a petticoat or underskirt. By 1575, a padded roll was placed around the waist to give skirts greater width below the waist. The English call these pads bum rolls. Later modifications of the farthingale were made. The circles were made of the same diameter top to bottom. Steel or cane spokes fastened the topmost hoop to a waistband. It was called a wheel, wheel drum of French farthingale. To avoid having the bodices appear disproportionately short in contrast with the wide width of the skirts, S uh, sleeves were made fuller with very high sleeve caps. The stomacher at the front, front of the body was elongated, ending in a deep V at the waist. Additional height came from high standing collars and dressing the hair high on the head. Ruffs grew to enormous widths. Made of sheer lace, they had to be supported by a frame called supportes or by starching. Methods of constructing ruffs included gathering one edge of a band of fabric or lace to the size of the neck to form a frill of deep folds or placing several layers of round large pieces one over the other. Open ruffs, almost a cross between a collar and a ruff, stood high behind the head and fastened in front into a wide square neckline. It was later called the Medici collar after the Medici Queen of France. The ropa was an outer gown or surcoat, made either sleeveless or with one of several types of sleeves. It fell from the shoulders, unbelted in an A-line to the floor. Some were closed in front, but most were open to display the dress beneath. The conch, aka conch, was a sheer gauze-like veil cut the full length of the body from shoulder to floor and worn like a cape. Married and adult women continued to cover the hair. Coif was a cap of white linen or more decorative fabric, usually with long lappets or short square or pointed extensions below the ears that covered the side of the face. Coif's shapes ranged from round to heart-shaped or gabled, which is a pointed arch. Over the coif, women pinned a band about 40 inches long and 4 inches wide. The ends either hang down at either side of the face or were arranged in decorative folds. 
Towards the mid to end of the century, the hair was combed back from the forehead, puffed up slightly around the face, then pulled into a coil at the back of the head. In England, imitating the queen, red, auburn and varying shades of blonde hair was fashionable. Hats were popular towards the end of the century and were usually small with high crowns and narrow brims and were trimmed with feathers. With few exceptions, footwear styles were similar for men and women. Men's styles tended to be more exaggerated. Square-toed shapes were also called duckbills, included decorations of slashings with puffs of fabric pulled through the openings. Women wore a ba backless shoe called mules. Some shoes had a tongue and tied shut with laces called latchets. High heel shoes for men and women appeared sometime during 1570s. Style worn only by women included low cut slippers with strap across the ankle and chopines with platform sole shoes. Boots were worn outdoors when horse riding. Men wore wide jeweled collars that were detachable. Both men and women wore neck chains of gold or other precious metals that were wrapped several times around the neck. Women wore pendant necklaces. Men and women pinned brooches to hats, hoods and other parts of the clothing. When ears were not covered, men and women wore earrings. Rings were worn everywhere. Women wore ferronias, jeweled belts with long cords hanging down the front. On the cord were mounted jeweled tassels, perfume holder called pomander, a purse or a mirror. Men and women carried purses which were suspended from belts. Fans were squares of embroidered fabric mounted on a stick. Later, fans included ostrich or peacock feathers and circular folding fans. Both men and women carried handkerchiefs and wore gloves with decorative edges. Women wore masks out of doors to protect against the sun and wind. Many cosmetics were made of potentially dangerous chemicals such as mercuric salts that were used to whiten the complexion. Red colouring was applied to the lips and cheeks. Perfumes were also used.